Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dick Broderson, and I am here with a very special guest, Mr. William Green. We, William, we had you on, on the show back on episode 345, and it just seems like audience can't get enough of learning from you and learning from how the best investors invest, and more importantly, how they live their lives. So with that being said, William, thank you so much for taking time and to, to join us here on the show. Ah, thank you. I'm delighted to be back. Every time I come back on your show, it's it's more and more successful. I was looking at it recently. I think I think am I right in saying it's now the the number one stock investing podcast in the world? Oh, William, thank you for teeing it up for me. Uh, I want to say yes, uh, <laughs> but well, cause, if cause I can... when I started coming on, you you know, it was a new show like seven years ago, and so it, it's it's so for me, I I feel like I got in at the at the beginning before you became famous. So, so thank you for getting me back again. Well, you're, you're too kind. You're too kind, William. So perhaps I can, I, I can tee it up for you because one of the reasons why we are as successful as you are might be because we started interviewing you. So let me, ah. let me send that sense of love back, back to you. <laughs> um, and you know, let's, let's continue where we left off with the, uh, with the previous, um, episode because I want to talk again about Richard Wise and Happier and then we're also going to talk about other things but it, it has been it has been profound everything that's been going down um in, in the wake of, of the book uh, you know, it has received a lot of praise from from well renowned investors and there's especially one person who is very enthusiastic about it and that is Mr. Charlie Munger who I think everyone in the audience know everything about um what has Charlie said about your book I'm very curious about that yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah, Charlie, Charlie, I, I actually said it was one of the best investment books ever written, and and incredibly kindly said he hadn't read a book that good for a long time, and and that kind of that kind of had a big impact on me in a way because I I think when you write a book, you feel so exposed and so vulnerable, and you're sitting in your study, hold up for in, in my case four or five years quietly in this vacuum this void and you're writing things with no idea whether it's going to resonate with anyone or whether whether you're misfiring totally and if you're a writer like me i've lived by the pen for basically 30 years there are enough times when you've actually screwed up and you failed totally and you've had stories killed that you spent months working on that you actually can never quite relax you never really know is this going to work are people going to like this and so the the reaction from a lot of readers who've written to me and have said, yeah, this book has kind of changed my life and has had a huge impact actually has has been enormously reassuring and enormously life affirming for someone as sort of sensitive to, to criticism and fear of failure as I am. And then to have Charlie, who's what, 97, almost 98 and, and not known for being a soft and gentle critic, right? I, you know, he's a he can be tough and brusque and, and um, very candid about stuff. To have him say, yeah, it, it's it's one of the best investment books um, ever written. That, that in a way, it was kind of like, oh, I can relax now. I can sort of I can sort of say, no, this actually is kind of worthwhile. And so I walked around in a kind of in a kind of haze of self-congratulation and, and, and pride for a couple of days. And then, of course, all of my old insecurities came flooding back. So then I was reading the first chapter of my book. I was looking over it again the other day, um, <laughs> reminding myself of what was in it. And, and I'd written all about Monish Pabrai. And one of the great lessons from Monish Pabrai that I'd written about when I just hung out with him in Irvine, California, and I was flying back from California to my home, and I write this memo to myself of lessons from Monish. One of the great lessons is, okay, live by an inner scorecard and don't worry about what others think of you. Don't be defined by external validation. And what I suddenly realized is I'm hugely defined by external validation and, and I care deeply about what others think of me. And it was just, it was just one of those reminders where you can so easily fool yourself into thinking, yeah, I'm wired this way, or this is what I believe. And, and I was just kind of thinking in, in investing, it's one of these areas where if you lie to yourself, if you're not self-aware, you're so vulnerable. And so for a writer like me, it's kind of it's kind of a little bit comic that I can fool myself into thinking that actually, you know, I, I live by an inner scorecard. 
and there's not really a price to pay. It's just kind of a human foible. It's just like you look at yourself and you laugh and you're kind of like, really, I, I still care so much what other people think of me. Uh, but as an investor, I actually think it's hugely important that that tendency that we have to deceive ourselves. And and I was sort of thinking about this. There's, there's one point in the book where I write about my friend Ken Schubenstein, who's a, uh, a neurologist who um, was a private equity investor uh, and, and, um, and hedge fund manager, very successful, very, very smart. And so he's really an expert on the brain and biases. And I remember Ken saying to me, the one thing that every investor should do is they should actually take Charlie Munger's list of 24 uh, causes of, of, of misjudgment, psychological biases and the like, and they should rewrite it and, and include their own biases and their own failings and their own mental glitches. And I remember Ken saying to me that one, one thing he's vulnerable to is authority bias. So, so if he saw that people like Charlie and Warren, people he really admired, had bought a particular stock, it, it swayed him. And so he needed to be aware of that vulnerability. And likewise, Howard Mark said to me that he knows he's inclined to worry. So he just he just has to know that he's he's filtering things through that particular um, kind of temperamental bias. So that during the 2008, 2009 global financial crisis, he had to sort of say to himself, well, I can't be a chicken here. This is an amazing opportunity and the prices are so low that I can't be a chicken. So, so in some ways, there, there, there's, a, there's a sort of self-congratulatory aspect to my, my celebrating the fact that people like Charlie have said something um, really nice about me. And then there's also this kind of reminder that I better actually be pretty careful because it, it shows me it shows me just how vulnerable I am to a, a, you know that, that need to sort of please others, um, f feel like, uh, you know, feel, feel like I'm approved of and, and, and admired. And, and that's a, that's a vulnerability. And I, and I think one of the things is you just have to understand your own quirks. So, so you have to be a kind of great user of the machine called Stig Broderson. And I have to be a great user of the machine called William Green. And that, and that requires me to understand, you know, that, that, this bit is kind of falling off, and this bit needs needs uh, le needs a little more, more oil, and this bit needs a repair. So, so um, yeah. So this this kind of led me to think about a lot of a, a, a lot of ways in which we're, we're in which we're vulnerable. I think. Yeah, you know, it's um, it makes me think of of um, Paul Charles Almanac. Just this amazing book, and there's this wonderful quote by uh, Richard Feynman where he's talking about. Yeah, I'm going to butcher this up, but it's some, somewhere uh, along the lines of don't fool yourself and remember you're the easiest one to, to fool. Exactly. And, That's exactly what the quote I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it happens, you know, whenever you said that, you know, for us in the value investing community, we often heard about, you know, the inner scorecard and we all subscribe to it. And I, I, I think whenever push comes to shove, it's like, no, we just we just can't. It will almost make us inhuman if if we did. And you know, just one person who who if if I had to 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 choose one person aside from Chalamonga, perhaps who really lives by that in a scorecard would be someone like Monis Papri. You know, absolutely brilliant person who now lives true to his values, and it's mm. it's wonderful. And, and even he said that whenever Buffett, you know, gave him the nod of of mm. you know his. How he thought about charity and Dakshana and and everything like he was like, oh I I I, f I felt I could I could I, I'm gonna butcher this up again too but something like die in peace or now I've achieved or he was like yeah I could that was die like and the, go to heaven the, now yeah exactly yeah and yeah. and so I I you know and, and that happens even to Manus like even can I say to the best of us it just I think that's just how we are wired yeah and and Manish, I think gets enormous satisfaction out of the fact that Charlie, who he absolutely reveres and rightly, uh, has kind of adopted him as a, as a friend and mentee. And, and I, I think for Monish, who's always been a bit of an outsider, right? That's, a, that's an amazing thing to have, um, you know, the, the, the resident genius of the investment community say, no, no, you're, you're fantastic. And, and I think even with Warren, um, much as we say he lives by an inner scorecard, and it's true that he does live by an inner scorecard, I do think there's some degree to which Warren enjoys the 
bright lights of uh, the Omaha annual meeting and 40,000 people flocking to revere him and listen to him and Charlie. And there's something kind of, we're, we're just complex characters, right? I mean, I think there's something that's really selfless about Warren and Charlie and they're there as teachers and they love imparting wisdom, but there's, there's, there's presumably ego there too. And I, and I, and and so I see that in myself as well, like this combination of arrogance and pride and vulnerability and fragility. And I just think I just think it's really useful to have this kind of inner inquiry, especially as a as an investor, because I think the the markets are so brutal that if you're if you have these underlying fault lines in your character, um, they're going to get exposed sooner or later. And so. If, for example, you're impetuous or you're fearful or you're inclined towards jealousy and, and envy of other people's returns, it's going to get you in the end unless you actually take some countermeasures. And I'm thinking of this a lot recently because I, I interviewed Bill Miller recently and, and he's talking to me about why Bitcoin is so wonderful. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, geez, back when I was writing this book, I remember spending a couple of days with him at his home in Maryland and his office in Baltimore. And he was saying to me, look, William, here's, here's why Bitcoin is so great. And at the time it was at 8,000. And I'm like, there's no bloody way I'm buying 8,000 on this thing that has no apparent value. What, what am I doing? And so here I am now, it's at what, 60 or 60,000 or something like that. I haven't checked it in the last couple of days. And I feel like such a schmuck. And I can feel the pain of missing out rising up and just knocking me off course. And I, I had I had lunch with, with Guy Spear a couple of weeks ago, who I'm close to, who, who runs the Aquamarine Fund, and um, who I know has been on this show as well. And I was saying to him, how, how do you deal with the whole cryptocurrency thing? And how are you thinking about it? And he said to me, look, I'm a farmer. I don't, I don't, I, I can just stay in these fields that I'm plowing, you know, I can just focus on these companies that have good destinations and that are, uh, and, and I don't need to play other games. And I just thought it was one of those things where I'm like, God, he has so much better a temperament than I do. Like for me, it's still kind of torture. And so I'm just, I just keep reminding myself, no, I shouldn't be investing in things I don't really understand. And so let me understand Bitcoin more. Let me figure it out. Let me really get my head around it. Cause I was so distracted by working on my book that I didn't, I, I sort of missed it. I just didn't really give it enough thought. So I just I just think this whole area of of self knowledge, self awareness, of asking yourself how you're wired, where you're vulnerable, where where your strengths are, um, temperamentally and emotionally, and where your weaknesses are, is just really really helpful. Well said, William. So um, here on the podcast, I don't think it's it's any surprise that we are avid readers. And uh, one of the most popular guests we had on here in this year, that was business author, uh, Jim Collins. That was back on episode 372. And what Jim did with his team was to analyze big sets of data and then look at the most successful company founders. And he concluded that there was no such thing as a right background to have, a right background as in this education level or rich or middle class or lower class or whatnot. And that was not the determining factor to be a successful company founder because we heard all these stories about like this person, he had this background, so that's why it happened. And this person had a different background, which is also why XYZ happened. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to hear um, how that translates into the investors you've been speaking to. And is there such a thing in, in your experience uh, as to have a right background to be a successful investor? There's such a tremendous range in the backgrounds of the people of, of people I've interviewed. Uh, but I think what I would say is, I think this is, I think it's true to say that either temperamentally or, or figuratively or literally, they're all outsiders. They're all people who diverge from the crowd and question orthodox opinion. And it, it makes sense because the, the only way you can beat the market is if you diverge from the market. So you have to, I think, come from a slightly strange place intellectually or 
sometimes physically or temperamentally maybe maybe you, you know i think of someone like um like sir john templeton who i interviewed 20 years ago in in the bahamas and he had physically removed himself from the crowd by moving to the bahamas and so he had this kind of detachment and he had grown up in this unconventional way in in winchester tennessee uh in this kind of small town life and then he then he'd gone to oxford as a as a Rhodes scholar and then he traveled for months to something like 30 countries if i remember rightly so so he had this kind of so he was always an outsider thinking differently and he had this this informational advantage i i think that came from the fact that he he was studying foreign countries and foreign cultures at a time when nobody else really even had passports for i mean it wasn't it wasn't it just wasn't common for people to fly for example it was sort of I mean, he he was he was going to Germany before World War Two in the run up. So he was seeing the the hysteria over Hitler. So so he saw the Olympics there before um, uh, before World War Two broke out. And then you think of someone like Monish, who grew up in. I think it was a twenty dollar a month apartment in the suburbs of Mumbai, which was then Bombay. So again, an outsider coming at things from from a different perspective or or you think of bill miller who was studying in a phd philosophy program instead of a, a an mba program and 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 then when he became a military intelligence officer and i i was talking to him recently about the extent to which studying philosophy instead of business had helped him and he's like well look that's why i gave 75 million dollars to to my old philosophy department as a gift because i wouldn't have been so successful if it hadn't been for them so, so they're all people coming from these weird backgrounds and slightly, slightly offbeat. Not that's not to say you can't just go to Wharton or Harvard Business School. There are plenty of people like like Joel Greenblatt and Howard Marks and like who, who've gone that path. But they're also quirky in their own special way. And then, and then, in in some ways, think of someone like Nick Sleep, who I write about at great length in the book, um, who's also the ultimate outsider, both in the way that he invests and in his background so so nick and for, for for your listeners who don't know them nick and his partner zach um who's called case sakaria but but goes by the their nickname zach they set up this fund nomad right that i think in 13 years have returned 921 percent and beat the market by something like 804 percentage points and it was they they regarded it as what they called a rebellion against the sin and folly of Wall Street. So the whole thing was incredibly idiosyncratic, and and you look at you look at where they came from, and it kind of makes sense that they were so offbeat. I, I I remember asking Nick about his childhood, and he said, "Well, well, look, I I went to this this private school, this boarding school, Wellington, which I think was set up by Queen Victoria in England." And it had something like 450 acres of land with one of these beautiful old English private schools. And he was one of the only kids who wasn't a boarder. So at the weekend, while all of these other kids were, were playing at school, uh, playing rugby and cricket and stuff like that, he was literally working in a pub. And so he said, I just was happy being outside the group. And, and so he got used to very early on not being a part of, a part of the group. And then and then goes off to university. I think he went to the University of Edinburgh. Starts off studying geology, and then switches to geography. So again, nothing like the conventional route that most people have in in studying in studying business and finance and accounting and all of that. And then didn't have any intention at all of becoming a, a fund manager. He actually wanted to be a landscape architect, and and he had this kind of fantasy that he was going to be building these beautiful parks, designing gorgeous parks where. Where people could, he, he's a bit of an aesthete, and 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 he's kind of and he's kind of spiritual and and philosophical, and he thought people are going to be able to to retreat from the the noise and ugliness and busyness of life, and they're going to be in these beautiful parks. And instead, he goes to work for this landscape architecture firm and discovers that he's just designing parking lots and and dormer windows. And then after a few months, they lay him off. And and he had an apartment in in Edinburgh that he and his future wife Sarita had bought, and so he wasn't thinking, let me let me become a fund manager. He literally is just looking around, thinking, 
oh, geez, how am I going to stay in Edinburgh? Well, let me think about what Edinburgh is good at. So he's like, well, they do IT. There are lots of IT companies. So, so he's thinking of doing that. And then he reads a book about the investment business, some obscure book on, on unit trusts. And he's like, oh, that sounds cool because it's kind of like an intellectual inquiry. So he ends up going to work um, at this tiny Scottish investment firm and discovers that he's really good at it. And so he's just like this weird intellectual who's landed in this profession by accident. And so while other, while other investors are reading, you know, accounting terms and, 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 and stuff like that, he was reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Pusick, which he became absolutely obsessed by. And, and the whole thing is, a, is this inquiry into, into values. And so Persig, who was this very eccentric guy, was fascinated by the idea of quality and what quality constitutes. So, so when Nick set up um, Nomad with, with Zach, it was really a kind of spiritual and philosophical exercise to see if you could create a fund that was all about quality. So would you treat your partners in a way that was high quality or would you squeeze them as much as you as much as you could to get as much money out of them could you be truly aligned with them so so for example they literally they, they they set up the they set up the fee structure for example so i think they had a tiny tiny annual management fee to cover their costs and then they took i think it was 20 percent of the profits but after a six percent annual hurdle and then they were like yeah, so so let's make it even harder for ourselves. So after a few years, they put their profits, their their, their incentive fee in a in a holding bucket, and they said, well, if we screw up, um, we'll we'll give back the profits. So they kept making it worse for themselves and better for their shareholders. And 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 I remember Nick saying that at one point during the financial crisis, when they had this kind of emergency meeting um, in in McDonald's to see if Nomad was going to survive. Um, he said, he, I didn't write about this in the book. He, he said, we actually, we were so deep in the hole. We were down so much. So I think Amazon was down about 50% that year, 46% for, for the fund. I think they were down. And, and he said, we actually owed years worth of fees. Like we were going to have to work for free for years. And then it just happened that they bounced back so unbelievably. They made about 400% over the next three or four years. They ended up doing incredibly but but so here I, I I write about this in the book. I, I say th these were these two odd ducks who landed by mistake in the investment business. A total outsider. Zach uh, Zach wanted to be a meteorologist, and and he used to read weather reports as a kid. And his parents just said it was stupid, and they were like, "No, you can't do that." And and so he was just this very eccentric, brilliant mathematician. Went to Cambridge, wanted wanted to work for his family's company, but his father got cheated basically and went bankrupt. He, he invested in a whole bunch of, of um, his father had, had, had fled from Iraq where they'd been purged, where, where Zach was born. And the father invested in all of these, in all of these companies that um, were run by unscrupulous people on Wall Street who were, they were basically Ponzi schemes, I think. And, and, and he just lost everything. He, he, he was leveraged, he invested, borrowed money, and he got taken advantage of by unscrupulous people and lost everything. So, so Zach, far from wanting to be an investor, wanted to, wanted to be a meteorologist and was disgusted by what he called the casino aspect of Wall Street, this, this tendency to, do every, to, to line your own pockets at other people's expense. And so for him as well, um, Nomad became this kind of this, this exercise in quality. That, that he, he loved the fact that you could, you could say, well, this isn't about the money. We're just, we're just going to we're just going to focus on long-term returns, on getting the best long-term returns we can. So everything is going to be super rational. We're just going to we're just going to own about ten stocks, and we're going to focus on companies that have great long-term destinations. We're not going to read any Wall Street research. We're going to we're going to think totally independently. We're just going to travel and see as many companies as as we can. Study the best business models and think about what what businesses are likely to reach a great destination in 10, 15, 20 years. And that led them to have this very concentrated portfolio that was full of these companies that embodied this model of, of scale economies shared. So, so companies like Costco and Amazon that grew by, by driving down costs massively, creating an incredible deal for their, share, for, for their customers and just giving them more and more and more value. 
And so as they grew, they, they gained this kind of competitive advantage that uh, these economies of scale, they just kept, kept sharing. And so Nick and Zach were just totally independent of Wall Street, just thinking about these questions of what's, what's the best business model of all. And so in a sense, they're the, they're the perfect example of people who didn't go the conventional route in terms of studying business and investing. They were, they were, they were thinking, they were thinking about these weird questions from, from Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance about how to build a quality fund, how to lead a quality life, how to, how to treat your shareholders with quality, how to live in an honorable way. And then, and then having cracked the investment problem, they retire from the business at the age of 45. And they say, well, we'll spend the second half of our lives giving back the money to society because we don't want the money to bend us out of shape. And we want the joy of, of giving back and seeing our money go to work and help other people. And so there's something so wonderfully eccentric and, and idiosyncratic about the whole thing. And I think they're just a, a really extreme example of, of, of this, this unorthodoxy, this willingness to question the conventional way of doing things. And and so I, I I don't want to be I don't want to I don't want to depress people who are going the regular route and are, are saying no I, I want to go to Wharton and I want to go to Harvard Business School I think I think that has tremendous value as well but even if you look at someone like Joel Greenblatt who I write about at length Joel Joel went to went to Wharton and he was just appalled by the fact that they kept telling him that the markets were efficient and he said I just didn't believe it I didn't buy it I could see that it wasn't true. And so the thing that actually changed him was um, reading an article in Forbes about Ben Graham. And he's like, that makes more sense. The market is bipolar. I can see that. And, and so that changed his life. So even someone who went this kind of conventional path, like, like Joe, ended up questioning it and, and veering from it. So I, th I think, again, one of the things you have to ask yourself as an investor is, is how how am I wired? Am I am I someone who who's comfortable being outside the herd, or do I need to be inside the herd? And again, it's not it's not that one is better or worse. It's that you need to understand yourself so you know what game to play. And Howard Mark said to me, most most people should index most of their money, which is a a great a great path where you're exploiting the wisdom of crowds. But if but if you want to be someone who outperforms over the long term, I think you've got to be a little weird. You, you've got to be a little strange. You've got to be comfortable outside the crowd. And and maybe that's one reason why I was so drawn to these people that I'm writing about is, is because I'm I'm a I'm a I'm an English writer living in New York. I I'm a Jew who went to to Eaton, the poshest oldest English school pretty much I you know so I'm kind of a weird outsider and so when I saw when I saw all these these maverick free-thinking iconoclasts like 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 Nick and Zach and and, and Joe Greenblatt and Monish Pabrai I I sort of recognize them as my weird tribe of misfits they're, they're much better investors than I am but I but there is something temperamentally similar I think um, be between a, a, a writer and a, uh, a and, and a weird maverick contrarian value investor, certainly. I think that's a that's a great segue to my next question for you, William. You know, there, there's this saying that concentration makes you rich, but diversification makes sure that you stay rich. Uh, you know the best investors in the world, and you follow their portfolios up close. Do you think that statement is true? It's it's a fascinating point, and I, I I think there's clearly a tremendous tension between um, the 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 benefits of concentration, where you see people like Joel Greenblatt in his early career having maybe eighty percent of his money in six to eight stocks, and uh, and he ends up making 40% a year over 20 years at, at, at Gotham, his, his original hedge fund, incredible performance by buying weird little stocks off the beaten path that, that he said other people would have bought if they'd done the work. Um, 
So there's that path that that's that's also the path that Nick Sleep and and Kay Sakaria took. Where when when I when I chatted with um, with Nick recently, he still basically just owned four stocks. His his personal portfolio was just um, Amazon, Costco, um, ASOS, and Berkshire, and that's it four stocks in his entire portfolio. And, and Zach, um, who's never sold a share of Amazon, um, had, when I spoke to him last, had 70% of his portfolio in Amazon. And so, um, I, I mean, amazing concentration. So there's this lure of concentration where you look at it and you're like, wow, if you want to outperform, this is this is the way to go. And, and yet, it's also, they, they've done incredibly well because A, they were really smart. B, they were kind of lucky. Uh, I mean, I remember Joe Greenblatt saying to me once when I, when I asked him to explain how that original fund had done so brilliantly, um, he said, look, we stayed small. Uh, I think that they, they had something like $300 million in assets when they closed it to outside investors and returned all the outside money. It, it remained really small. Um, and he said, we concentrated our bets and we got lucky. He said, for some reason, we just didn't, we didn't have any major disasters. And he said, part of it was I had a very high hurdle. I, I had to be absolutely, absolutely certain before I invested in something because he said it tortured him to lose money. So it wasn't an accident, but there was an element of luck. Um, I'd say there's probably an element of, of luck with Nick and Zach, despite the fact that they were brilliant and they figured out this one great business model of scale economies shared that, that dominate dominated their their portfolio in the end um but then as i was saying there's this tension because if you're concentrated and something goes wrong um you may not survive and so look say at at the Sequoia Fund that, that Bill Ruane ran. I remember many years ago, for, for your listeners who don't know Bill Ruane, he's the guy who, when Buffett um, uh, shut down his limited partnerships in the 60s, he, and the market was massively overvalued, he said, well, if you, if you still want to invest, invest with my friend Bill Ruane, who's great. And Ruane proceeded to have this unbelievable record, beating the market by thousands of percentage points over decades. And I had this kind of rare interview with him, I think in 2001, um, where I was asking him the, the secret of his success. And he again said, look, I have, I, I, I want to really concentrate. I have, uh, I want to know everything I can about seven or eight ideas. And he said, if you find something really cheap, why not put 15% of it, 15% uh, of your assets in it? And so at the time, this was 2001, so it was still, I think it was still the tech bubble at the time, the dot-com bubble it hadn't yet burst in uh, around March of that year. He had, I think, 35% of his portfolio in Berkshire Hathaway, which was totally out of favor. And, and he said, look, you have the smartest guy in the country running this undervalued business that nobody loves. Every, everyone is saying Buffett has lost his touch. And so he was totally happy to do that. And, and I was hugely impressed with that. And I thought, well, that's brilliant. But then you... You look at his successor, Bob Goldfarb, who I remember Bill Ruin telling me was absolutely brilliant. I, I've never met Goldfarb, but I've heard wonderful things about him and that he's a really terrific investor. Goldfarb had this kind of stunning record and was hugely admired and then had basically a third of the Sequoia Fund in Valiant Pharmaceuticals, which imploded. And I don't know, did it go down 90 something percent? And it basically ended this illustrious career of this great investor, this one huge mistake. And so I think that gives you a sense of the double-edged sword of concentration. It's a beautiful idea when it works. And if you're right and you're lucky, it's fantastic. But if someone as smart as Goldfarb can get blown up by Valiant, that's a really, really good lesson for the rest of us, just to be a little humble and a little wary. And I, I think of someone like Templeton telling me all those years ago when I interviewed him in, I, I guess, around 2000, saying to me, look, for a regular investor, a regular investor ought to own five mutual funds, probably, 
and they should be giving you exposure to different parts of the market. And I've thought about that a lot over the years because he said to me, why would you be so arrogant as to believe that you can pick the best fund, the best advisor, the best country? Um, and it's tricky because Templeton, Templeton was brilliant and came top of his class at Yale and was a Rhodes Scholar and all of that. And, and so he was able to do things like, like, like at the time that I was interviewing him, it was the, the Asian financial crisis. And, and he made this enormous bet on a Korean fund um, that had been the single worst performer of the last year. And he put something like $10 million in it and, and made an absolute fortune. It, became, it was the number one fund over the next year. It was just a brilliant contrarian bet. So he could pick the single best country. I mean, he, he had the intelligence and the temperament and he was so on top of it that I think he could pull off that stuff. But I'm constantly reminding myself, because I'm a slightly fearful person and I'm slightly skeptical of myself and worried that I'm uh, full of hubris and arrogance and pride and self-deceit, I'm always saying to myself, well, yeah, what if I'm wrong? What if this person I trust who's a great fund manager turns out to be a con man? Or what if, what if I have all of my money in one brokerage firm and there's a cyber attack, God forbid, and it falls apart or um i i'm just I, so so i sort of so so there's a part of me temperamentally that's very drawn to these highly concentrated investors i i have huge admiration for the people who just own four stocks 10 stocks 12 stocks you know i mean i i think that's wonderful but i think you've got you've got to be wired in a particular way where where it's not painful for you when the market gets killed and I, I, I remember Greenblatt saying to me that there were times where in a matter of days, his portfolio would go down 20, 30 percent. And he said, that's fine for me because I understand what I own. But he said there was no way that he could have outside shareholders who could cope with that kind of volatility. So. So, yeah, I just think there's a there's a real tension and you and you b between the need to survive and the um, the yearning to outperform. And you have to find some, some comfortable balance that suits your temperament. So you look at someone like Fred Martin, who I write about, and he, he just has this rule where he says, at, at the time of purchase, I'm never going to put more than 3% of my portfolio in any stock. And he just says, um, so he has most of his money in 40, well, he, he owns about 45 stocks and he lets them run. So he owns them for at least a decade on the whole. So, so if something performs really well, Great, it becomes a big part of his portfolio. But he said that it, that that strict adherence to that rule has enabled him to survive for decades and and yet outperform. And and you look at you look at Tom Gaynor as well, where he he owns about a hundred stocks, which seems absurdly diversified in some ways. And yet, if you look more closely at his portfolio, actually he two thirds of the portfolio in the top 20 holdings. So it's actually, so, so Tom describes himself as radically moderate. And I, th I think that's an interesting balance that suits, suits his personality. Um, this kind of balance between concentration and diversification, outperformance and survival. So, so yeah, it's a, that's a, that's a sort of a long and, and complicated answer to a very difficult question, I think. No, I, I really like that, William. At the end of the day, it's all about learning, becoming a better version of yourself. And you know, I, whenever I look at the value investing community, I really, I know it's hard to read the label uh, from inside the box, but it seems like we have a unique culture in the value investing community. And I, I do think a lot of that comes from most of us having learned directly from Warren Buffett himself, if not in person, then through his letters and through everything that he is um, interviews and whatnot. And Buffett has said himself that he wants his legacy to be as a teacher. You know, uh, he was asked through uh, one of the, um, or he was asked during one of the uh, annual shareholders meeting, like, what do you want your legacy to be? And I, I kind of found that to be very insightful. You know, it wasn't like the best investor of all time or whatnot. It was to be a teacher. And whenever you study Buffett's relationship with his old professor, boss, and mentor, 
uh, Benjamin Graham. I do think it explains a lot of how the value investing community got started and where we are now. Hmm. So from, from your perspective as an educator in the value investing community, what do you think that will happen to the community when Buffett and Munger are no longer among us? I think they're irreplaceable. I I don't I don't see I may be totally wrong, but I don't see forty thousand people a year flocking to Omaha to hear Greg Abel, Ajit Jain, Ted Weschler, and Todd Combs talk if if those are the successes. And I and that's that's not in any way a diss on them. I mean I I I I remember walking walking on the floor um uh in omaha at the annual meeting with monish and guy spear and and running into greg abel and he and he sort of you know just comes and chats with us and he's standing there with you know posing for photos with us couldn't have been more humble modest smart amiable i mean you you know you just look at him as this kind of um you, you can exactly see why why Warren would like him like not arrogant and yet really smart and and just uh, uh, just totally capable but not charismatic in the way that Warren and Charlie are I mean Ch Charlie has a strange kind of charisma right like the uh, the I have nothing to add kind of curmudgeonly brilliance but there's something <sighs> I, I remember it feeling like a comedy show. Like it was like you were watching Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon when you see these two old guys um, quipping on the on the stage. And um, I remember once hearing hearing Charlie say something about how you know when you mix turds with raisins, you've still you still got turds. <laughs> and, and Warren just sort of says, "Now you see why I do all of the talking." And um, and it's just funny. You just you watch them and you think they're not only really clever and really successful and really honest about their mistakes and stuff but they're they're funny they're entertaining and so it's kind of this gag show as well where you're learning i i don't i don't see that that can survive i may be totally wrong but then so but i think one of the things that's that's extraordinary about the value investing community is as you mentioned is that these guys are teachers and i think i think ben graham was extraordinarily generous in sharing his ideas and warren has taken that habit of being extraordinarily generous in sharing his ideas same with charlie they're they're teachers it's a it's a um it's a kind of didactic exercise the whole company right it's like this is this is how you run things and i remember nick nick sleep and and zach saying that when they went to berkshire to the annual meeting the first time, it was like the scales fell from their eyes because Zach had been working at, I think, Deutsche Bank at, during the tech bubble. And he was just appalled by the, the willingness of Wall Street to sell any old crap to any credulous investor who'd buy it. And then all, all of these, and he was a broker and it just killed him because he would, you know, he'd seen how his father had been ripped off by unscrupulous brokers and, um, and had been bankrupted. And and suddenly it's like this cosmic joke that he sees him, that he has to become a salesman himself of crappy ideas. And he just couldn't do it. He, he was a terrible broker and couldn't sell anything. And then he, and then he goes to work for um, uh, Marathon, the company where, where Nick was working before they set up Nomad. And they go to Berkshire together, I think in 2000 or 2001. And he's like, wow, Warren and Charlie, they're talking about businesses and, and businesses we love and businesses that are going to do great over the long term. And, and he was like, there's no element of the casino here. It was just the most fabulous thing. And so Nomad grew out of that idea of like, no, no, this is, we're, we're, actually, we're not just lining our own pockets. We're not selling crap to people. Um, we're studying great businesses and collecting them for the long term. And so that, that role model, it wasn't, it wasn't just that they were hearing the ideas from Warren and Charlie. It was they were actually seeing the behavior being modeled by them. And... One, one of the things that had a huge impact, I think, was seeing that Warren and Charlie were getting salaries of, I think, $100,000 a year to run this company that now has, what, a, a market value of 
600 billion, something like that, 650 billion. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing. So they were, they had set themselves up to make money as your partner. Um, they weren't making money off fees, off screwing you, squeezing fees out of you, regardless of how well or badly they performed. They were making money um, alongside you. And when they messed up, they would tell you. I, 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 I always loved it when I went to one of the meetings and, and Charlie said, yeah, we, we should have bought Google. We totally failed you. And then as if that's not enough to have told 40,000 people, we totally failed you with Google. He says, yeah, we totally screwed up Walmart as well. And uh, we should have owned that. I mean, it's a wonderful thing, that that honesty and integrity. And so I, I think one of, the, one of the great lessons is that it's not, it's not just what they write that's been so helpful or what they say that's so helpful. It's, it's the behavior that they model. And you see that and it makes you want to be a better person. And this isn't, this isn't to say they're ideal. I mean, they, they have their foibles and flaws just as all of us do. Um, but you look at this kind of enlightened capitalism that they embody where they're trying to be honorable. They're trying to be transparent. They're trying to treat you as partners. And it gives you a sense of, well, there's a better way to do this. We don't need just to be selfish and just to look out for ourselves. And, and you, th you think of someone like Charlie saying, um, when, when I asked him about what the, what the secret of a happy life was and what we could learn from him and, and more about a happy life, he immediately starts talking about partnerships. And, and, and he said, Warren has been a marvelous partner to me and I've been a good partner to him. And uh, which I think is also a very interesting way to phrase it, that he's, He's diminishing his own uh, his own his own role. His his praise for Warren is higher than his praise for himself. And then he said, "And we have a really simple model, a really simple system, which is if you want to have a good partner, be a good partner." And so, so to me, when you see that behavior, that has an enormous impact on you. It makes you there's this better way of doing business, and and so. I assume that culture is going to go on because I assume that in picking people like Greg Abel and Ajit Jain, those guys embody that same mindset and that culture will survive for a while. But without, without those two charismatic guys there to teach you, some, something will change. Something it's, but then, but then you think about, you think about Charlie's phrase that he's always, he's always been hanging out with the eminent dead. So he's, he's also drawing great guidance and insight from people like Ben Franklin and Darwin and, and Einstein. And so, so there is something about the way that great behavior endures or great insights endure where I, I think, we're just very lucky that they've that, that 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 they've left us with so so many transcripts of their of their talks and so many interviews and 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 things like poor Charles Almanac. So you'll always be able to um, to study their lessons in the same in the same way that Charlie can study Ben Franklin. But I. But I don't know. It's 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 like with Jack Bogle not around. There's something different, right? Like, did Vanguard ever find a real replacement for Jack Bogle? Um, I mean, I'm sure they were extraordinary business people, and the company has continued to grow incredibly. But Bogle is a kind of moral force, um, fighting for the rights of shareholders. That's uh, his. You, for that, you have to go to the books that he left us with, and so I. I don't know. So part, part of what I was doing in, in my own book, I think, was trying to celebrate and honor these people who I think embody a, a more enlightened way of doing capitalism. So I could so I could I could try to preserve some of those ideas. So I so I I do think the fact that we can study these people who are great role models is it is immensely helpful. Um what what whatever you're studying, whether it's spirituality or um, uh, or philosophy or investing, you you want to, as as Charlie would say, hang out with the eminent dead, hang out with the people who were the best 
in previous generations. And, and one, of, one of my favorite parts in Richer, Wiser, Happier was actually where I think, I think it was an obscure part that almost nobody will notice that I think I, I tucked away in the notes on sources and resources where I talked about Jack, Jack Bogle tearing up in a conversation that I had with him. Hey, I am so excited about this sponsor that we have. The name of the company is Fold. They have a Visa debit card and here's the card right here. I use this thing literally every single day. Um, every time I swipe it, I get at least 1% back in, in rewards and the rewards are in Bitcoin. And um, some of the rewards go as high as 100%. There's even a full Bitcoin that you can win. After you swipe the card, you spin this little wheel on their app and then it produces the uh, reward. But the lowest uh, reward you'll get is a 1% uh, reward. The thing I really like about this card is um, you can also on their app buy uh, gift cards. And so Amazon is one of the partners that they have and you can go out and buy an Amazon gift card and you get 5% back when you use this card and so like all your Christmas shopping or whatever it might be that you're doing on Amazon, you're getting 5% back. It's all paid to you in Bitcoin rewards. You can withdraw those Bitcoin rewards to a self custody wallet, whatever you want to do with it. There's no gimmicks. There's nothing that you're not seeing up front. Um, it's just an amazing uh, company, an amazing platform and every single swipe I'm getting Bitcoin. So I love it. Um, if you want to sign up for this thing and I'm telling you, this thing is, this thing is a no brainer. Uh, go to foldapp.com slash TIP. That's foldapp.com slash TIP. You'll get 20% off uh, their spin plus annual fee uh, when you sign up uh, with that link. So go to foldapp.com slash TIP. And it, it was on the phone. I thought the phone had gone dead and I'd, I'd lost him. And then I realized he was choking up because he was talking about his mentor, Walter Morgan, who was one of the pioneers of the investment business. And he said, he said, Walter Morgan just had this idea that the shareholder is king. And he said, he said, my God, once one of the shareholders wrote to him and said, Mr. Morgan, I don't have a good suit. Do you have a suit? And he said, and Mr. Morgan sent him one of his own suits. And that, that spirit pervades Vanguard, I think. So it's something that Bogle got from his mentor, Walter Morgan. And when Vanguard was driving down fees and treating shareholders well, um, that was because Bogle had learned that the shareholder is king from Walter Morgan. And so in a sense, I was trying to preserve this, this kind of, this lineage of decent, honorable shareholder oriented thinking that had come to us from Walter Morgan through Bogle, even though both of these guys were no longer alive. Let's talk about the next generation of, uh, of value investors. Uh, let's specifically talk about uh, First Eagles, Matthew McLennan. Um, depending on which generation you are, uh, you might uh, you might think of him differently, not in any kind of bad way, but I guess to, to some generation, it might be the person who took over from the legendary Jean-Marie Villan just one week before the Lehman Brothers collapse. Uh, but in any case, you have the, you have the privilege of having to, to speak with both of them. Um, back on episode 345, last time you were on the show, we talked about uh, Jean-Marie Villard, and I'll definitely recommend everyone to go back and listen to that. But today, I would like to talk about the new generation. I would like to, like to talk about Matthew McLennan. Uh, perhaps some in the audience are not as familiar with him. Um, so for those of, of us who are not, could you please introduce him to our audience and also tell us about his untraditional background? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a fa it's a fascinating background. And, and first, I, I should tell you, I've, I've actually been hired as a strategic advisor for First Eagle just recently. So, um, uh, so I, I part of, part of the pleasure of that is actually that I've got to spend more and more time with with Matthew McLennan, and um, and he he does have one of the most unusual backgrounds of any investor I've come across. It, 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 it makes it makes Monish's background and Templeton's background seem more conventional. I mean, literally, he grew up. Matthew McLean grew up. I think the first six years of his life in Papua New Guinea. And I, I, I once joked to him. I said, um, "You're the greatest investor um, from Papua New Guinea." And he said, "Sample size of one." Uh, and it's and it's it's true. It's a very unlikely background. And and his parents were these these kind of. I guess adventurous. I think his mother was an artist and, and physiotherapist and his father was a land surveyor. 
And and so they start off, they just go to Papua New Guinea as a kind of adventure. And then they end up buying a property in Australia that was this beautiful place bordered by rainforest. And they were planning to get these permits to connect to the electricity grid and couldn't get the permits. So, so McLennan literally grew up in this house that had like no electricity, um, no hot running water. So I, I remember him telling me that when he wanted to take a shower, for example, they would take a black plastic bag and they would fill it with water and they would hang it um, outside in the, in the afternoon sun. And then he would shower under a tree with this warm water that had been heated up in the black plastic bag. And he said throughout his childhood, basically, they, um, th they didn't have a TV. And then finally, his dad decides to get a TV. And, and because they don't have electricity, they rig the TV up to the, the car battery. And then one day, his dad forgets that it's rigged up to the car battery. And so he pulls out of the, the driveway and drags this TV through the, uh, through the front door. So they never had a TV again. The TV was destroyed. So he basically spends his childhood in this very eccentric way, um, removed from what he called the literal buzz of existence. And so he just was reading and literally reading a lot of the time by gas lamp. And, and he had this grandfather who he described as a kind of true intellectual who I think he'd been a doctor on a geophysical expedition to Antarctica and, and he bought stocks and he, and he collected wine and, and cultivated roses. And so, so there was this sense in which McLennan came from this kind of family of intellectual explorers and kind of oddballs who were, were totally outside the conventional path of life. And, and so there's something deeply intellectual about him. He was, he, he said to me once, he, he, he collects these kind of mental models, these ideas, and he collects them in his, in his, in his iPhone, I think. And he said, he just goes over and over them. Like, like his image for it was like, like raking my Zen garden. And so, 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 so he's thinking kind of really seriously about the lessons of history, for example. So he would, he would, he would be deeply influenced by something like Thucydides history of the P Peloponnesian war, which would, where he would see, well, the reason that Sparta and Athens went to war was because they had all of this hubris and this, this rush to judgment. And so he's like, so, so you want to have the opposite qualities from, from that. You want to have humility and, and you want to move slowly. So he's literally, so he's taking lessons on how to, um, on how to live and how to invest from, you know, one of the first history books ever written, an account of, of Sparta's war with Athens thousands of years ago, I guess. And so one of the things that he learns from all of these studies, these kind of free, free thinking studies of, of history and science and, and, and various other disciplines is to have this tremendous respect for uncertainty. And, and so what he said to me is, if you look back at history, you start to realize that the world is intrinsically uncertain and unpredictable. And you, you need to position yourself as an investor and in life to, to participate in the march of mankind, but to survive the dips, to survive these periods of episodic disruption where everything goes to hell. And, and COVID is a perfect example of it, right? Something where no economists were saying, yeah, there's gonna be this massive economic disruption uh, and, and disruption to the way we work and the way we live from COVID. Nobody predicted that. We, we knew there could be a pandemic, but nobody said, at the end of 2019, this is this is going to change our lives over the next couple of years, and and so one of one of the um, one of the mistakes that investors make all of the time, as McLennan pointed out to me, is that we assume that the next period is going to resemble the current period or the last period, and this is this is something that Buffett warned about after 9/11, where Buffett said look, I screwed up because I didn't realize the, just how exposed we were to the threat of terrorism. And he said, what it shows you is you need to think about your exposure rather than your experience. You need to ask yourself, where am I exposed to risk rather than um, 
What have I just experienced that makes me think that the world is going to continue this way? And this is a really, really important idea because if you look at a period like now, we've just had, what, 10, 12 years of a bull market. We're all feeling pretty good, uh, at least if we're, we're investors. Okay, so the world is, a, uh, is in turmoil in terms of the pandemic and there are all sorts of political woes and difficulties. I, I'm not diminishing that. But, but if you're an investor, there's a tremendous temptation to be um, complacent and to assume that the future will look good because this is our experience in the past. And, and what McLennan said to me that I think is, a, is an incredibly helpful lesson from history is he said, think about what the world looked like, say, from 1908 to 1911, where you just come through this period where everything was golden, the world was going well, the economy was, was doing great. It was a period of expansion. And so he said, if you, if you learned the lessons of your recent experience, it was that things are going to continue to be great. And then you look at what happened over the next few years and everything fell apart. So, so the first sign of this really was in 1912, I guess, when the Titanic sinks. And so, so the Titanic is this kind of, um, uh, emblem of man's triumph over nature you know we can we can conquer everything because we're so smart we can build an unsinkable ship and then the unsinkable ship sinks in 1912 a reminder that nature whether whether it's a pandemic or uh, an iceberg um tends to have the last laugh so you want to you want to be a little more humble about um your your feelings that you've conquered nature then world war one breaks out in 1914, a couple of years later. Then 1918 to 1919, you have the Spanish flu epidemic, which I think killed 50 million people. Then you have the crash of 1929. Then you have the Great Depression. Then you have the rise of Hitler that grows out of, you know, massive inflation, tearaway inflation in Nazi Germany. And then you have World War II breaks out in 1939 to 1945. So you think you go back to 1908 to 1911, this period of calm, and you think, well, we live in a benevolent, benign world where everything kind of expands and goes well. And then it's followed by three decades of disaster. And then, so one of the lessons from those decades of disaster is that you don't really want to invest in stocks because stocks gave you terrible returns. And... Um, were incredibly volatile. And yet, then right after World War II, from 1945 on, we have this golden era for investors where the world is calm, there's expansion. So, so, so you needed once again to say, no, no, this is a, this is a very Howard Marks kind of observation. The, the world, the, there are these pendulum, uh, you know, it's, it, it, sorry, it's, it, it's helpful to view the world as a kind of pendulum where it's cyclical. The pendulum just keeps swinging. And so you have this period of tremendous calm followed by a period of, of, of chaos and volatility, then a period of calm, then a period of chaos and volatility. And, and so one of the great lessons, I think, is, is that you want to position yourself to survive these periods of episodic disruption and also to exploit these periods of episodic disruption. It's not, it's not just about being fearful and saying, oh my God, the world can go to hell. It's about saying, during these periods where things get crazy, um, that's when tremendous opportunity comes about, whether it's the early period of COVID or 2008, 2009, when the market was being crushed or when when the tech bubble blew up in March 2000, these periods of disruption, if you have your wits around them, uh, 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 if you have your wits about you and you've positioned yourself carefully to survive them and to exploit them, are actually the greatest gift for an investor. But you need to position yourself so that you're going to survive those periods of uncertainty, of, of, of trauma. And... So what does that actually mean in practical terms for, 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 for you and me and our listeners here? I, I, I think it means you want to start by saying to yourself, 
where, where am I fragile? Where am I exposed? And what if the next period doesn't resemble this current period? Would I survive? And, and so one of the things Howard Marks said to me is, is the real question is, do you push the limits? And so you want to just make sure that you're not overreaching, especially in these periods that are conducive to complacency. You don't want to be investing borrowed money, I think. You don't want to have a lot of leverage. You don't want to have a lot of debt. You want to keep some dry gunpowder. And I think you also don't, you don't want to add a tremendous amount of complexity to your life where you position yourself in a way that you have too many responsibilities that could come back and haunt you if suddenly things fall apart. You want to try to keep your life fairly simple, um, develop good habits like, you know, meditation and exercise and stuff that are conducive to equanimity. Um, so that before things go wrong and become chaotic, you've already bedded down these these good habits rather than rather than waiting till there's turmoil. And so I I think it's partly just learning the lessons of history, knowing, knowing that things are cyclical, knowing that we have this behavioral defect, this tendency to assume that the future will resemble the current period. And, and then I mean, there's a there's another wonderful practical idea from from McLennan where he just he just he just looks at the markets as a kind of the global markets as kind of a, a block of marble and then like a sculpture he's just chipping away everything that he thinks brings fragility to the portfolio so so for example he would chip away um, companies that that have very expeditionary management you know that that are taking crazy risks or that or companies that have opaque balance sheets or or you look at countries that don't respect property rights and you say well yeah maybe i can make a fortune in russia but i should at least be be wary because maybe they don't respect property rights and 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 you want to chip away your behavioral defects as well so you know that most people rent stocks for the short term and trade in and out and they and they think that they can predict the the market and can time the market, which we know that we can't. I mean, maybe maybe Soros can, I don't know, or Drucker Miller or, or Jim Simons, I, I don't know, um, but but the rest of us can't. And so, so you're chipping away all of these sources of fragility and you're focusing on error elimination rather than just assuming that everything is always going to be golden. And then likewise, when the pendulum shifts direction and suddenly all of those unresilient investors are reeling and are frightened. You're in a position to step in calmly as Howard Marks did in, in 2008, 2000, 2009 and say, well, yeah, things are so cheap now that actually this is a tremendous opportunity. And so, so I think it's a, it's a different, it's a different way of operating in the world where instead of being a heat seeking missile and chasing whatever's hot at that moment you're positioning yourself so that you're detached from from the crowd and you're just observing it and you're saying when when is risk priced attractively when is it not priced attractively and how can i just behave in a more dispassionate and rational way and and that's that's hard to do you see it with someone like buffett where buffett gets criticized for sitting on 100 and Forty billion dollars in cash or whatever—it's very difficult, and and you look like a fool for long periods when everything's going right. When I, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, he's a very good investor, and and as part of his his kind, he he had bought a, a a Tesla a few uh, three years ago, and 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 he has a sort of play portion of his portfolio, it's like a tiny portion of his portfolio, and he said to me, "Yeah, I put two thousand dollars in." in Tesla stock at the time, which is nothing, right? And he's like, it's $50,000 now, three years later. And there's a part of me that hears that. And I'm like, Jesus, I can't believe, you know, that I didn't buy Bitcoin when Miller told me it was $8,000 a coin and I, and, and I didn't buy Tesla. And so actually to have that emotional distance, that detachment is very, very hard in, in real life. You know, I, I like that example. Um, 
William, and, and sort of like takes me to the next question because I would like to talk about how you invest because you, you've been on the show quite a few times and it, it's clear from the conversations that you're a very humble person and, and you even said today that you you don't feel like you were wired the same way as the greatest investors. And I think that's something a lot of our listeners can can resonate with. You know, we, we hear all these things, we perhaps some of it is a bit anecdotal and we think we should do the same thing, but like pulling a trigger, that's just, that's just hard. But then the big difference is that you have access to these investors, which is not the case for our listeners. And so with all of your, your knowledge with, with the access that you have, I'm curious to hear how you decided to invest with three active money managers. Uh, you also have two passive index funds, ETFs, and, and you also still do a few individual stock picks. Like, How did you come up with that was the right strategy for you? What was your process? Yeah, and it, and it may not be the right strategy. Um... But but yeah, hopefully the way that I've thought through this issue is is at least instructive. At least it highlights some of the issues that I think we have to grapple with. So so one of the things is so so I've owned two index funds, two Vanguard index funds, just the international index and and the um, the total market U.S. total market index fund that I've owned you know for decades basically. And whenever um, my wife is putting money in a 401k or an IRA, or I'm putting money into a 529 plan for my two kids, for example, um, it would always go into index funds like that, basically. And the reason for that, and, I, and, I, and I've, I've owned index funds in my own account as well, I, I still do. The reason for that is that I'm kind of hedging against my own fallibility and my own hubris. And I'm aware that over the very long term, the chances of my outperforming after expenses and after taxes um, are not great historically. And so I think I have a competitive advantage that comes from the fact that I know a lot of great fund managers, and I think I can pick some of them. But on the other hand, I'm aware of my powers of self-deception and self-delusion and hubris. And so, so I'm hedging against that. And the fact that I'm investing my wife's money and my kids' money that way is, is in a sense what I'm doing is I'm saying they shouldn't pay the price for my hubris, for my self-deception. And so if I'm wrong and I'm not that good, um, then they'll be fine. And so that's how I thought through that issue. And then at the same time, clearly one of the most important determinants of whether you're a successful investor it's just keeping costs down. I, I remember Jack Bogle saying to me many years ago, he said that the, the math of investing was so obvious, it was so elementary, it was just so clear that on average, index funds were gonna outperform um, actively managed funds because the costs were just so much lower. And people just accused him in the early days of it being an exercise in mediocrity, but it turned out to be true. And so, so I know that keeping costs down overall and not trading in and out of the market and just consistently adding to that part of index funds is going to be a smart thing to do over the long term. And so I've done that. That's a that's a fun, so that's a sort of that's one bucket of the portfolio. And and I've also owned Berkshire Hathaway for not nearly as long as I should, but for a while. And I, I I thought they were past their peak many years ago. And so I was like, nah, I, I missed it already. Same my same instinct with Bitcoin or uh Tesla. You know, I always say, think I've missed I've missed it. it. And it goes back, I remember when I was like 17 years old at boarding school and the Rolling Stones um were doing a reunion tour. And I was like, nah, I missed it. They'd, I missed the golden years. They're like 50 now. And um I was like, why would anyone go see them when they're 50? They were probably in their late 40s. And I just thought I'd missed it, so I didn't go see them play at Wembley. And so it's kind of the same, that same sense that you always kind of miss the boat already. So here I have it with investing as well. But again, with Berkshire, one of the things that I'm thinking, I'm not thinking, okay, so it's going to massively beat the market over many years. I think it'll do well. I think it's resilient. It's set up to be the last man standing. It's very conservative. And I like that, so that suits my temperament. But it's also that you're not paying a management fee. And so... So again, it's a way 
of saying, yeah, you have the float working for you and you have no management fees. So you add that to my index funds and I've got low costs working for me. So so I think that's a that's a really important part of thinking about how you're going to succeed over the long term. The other really prosaic, banal thing to say is that one of, one of the great lessons of investing that I think we probably don't talk about enough is that if you just get this mundane thing right of taking full advantage of your IRA, your 401k plan, your 529, whatever, whatever tax deferred vehicles are available to you, you're so far ahead of the game. So if you just keep putting money in low cost funds, in tax advantaged vehicles, you kind of won already. Um, and so, so, I, so those are those are two smart things that I think I've done. We'll see if they turn out to be smart. But so far, over the last thirty years, they've been they've been smart, and um, and 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 they're easy to do. Um, but then, once in a while, what happens to me is I get carried away because I see. So I so I vow that I'm not going to buy individual stocks, and then and then I do something like I I go to India for five days with Manish Pabrai. And we're traveling around. And I see that you know things are getting killed, and he's buying stuff that's cheap. And it's really hard for me not to say, "God, I can see what he's doing. And I can see that it's really smart." And and so there's a part of me that also, um, I guess it, I guess it's a form of authority bias, as we were talking about before with Ken Schubenstein. That that when I see people that I admire and who I think are really smart and who've done the work, there's a part of me that wants that wants a piece of that. And I think, I think in a way, there's an idiosyncrasy here to my, my wiring, which is, I'm kind of an empathetic person. And I interview these people. And I get into their heads, and I get into their lives. And, and I think buying a stock that they bought very cheap in a contrarian way that nobody else liked, is a, there's a sense in which I'm aligning myself with them temperamentally and emotionally. That's a, a weird vulnerability of mine, I think, because um, it's kind of like, this is my team. These are, these, are, these are people I like and admire. And so when COVID um, started to ravage the markets in early 2020, I saw that Monish had bought... Um, he hadn't really owned any U.S. stocks for a while, one or two maybe, but he hadn't bought anything really. Didn't you know? He couldn't. He couldn't find a single stock to buy out of thirty-seven hundred public companies in the U.S. And so he'd been buying stuff in Korea and China and places like that. And then when the market um, got um, slammed by COVID, he bought thirteen percent of Seritage Growth Properties, this um, this mall operator. And to me, there's something kind of beautiful about that, right? Like it's a it's a consumer contrarian thing to do. Um, uh, the last thing you want to buy when nobody is allowed to leave their homes and go shop in a mall is a mall operator. And I see that and I'm like, well, he's bought 13% of it. So this is not like Monish dabbling. This is Monish. And I remember talking to him about it. And he's like, yeah, I think I'm going to make 10 times my money over the next 10 years. And so there's something that's irresistibly uh, seductive about something like that for me. It's it's someone I like and admire, a massive bet by them. It's contrarian, which appeals to me because I'm I'm naturally not part of the herd. Um, it makes abundant sense because it's it's like you you know how we always hear those stories where someone says, "Yeah, I bought a a brownstone." in the heart of Manhattan in the 1970s when New York was going bankrupt. And so there are these periods of episodic disruption where you can take advantage, you can buy a prime asset um, that you then tuck away for many years. So around June and July 2020, when the market was still getting killed, I, I bought Seritage and as it kept going down, I kept buying more. And so I did that. And then I think around September 2020, when Berkshire was massively out of favor, I was thinking, well, I'm going to be happy to own Berkshire pretty much forever, I think. Um, so let me just keep adding to that. So I bought that about four times as well as the market was getting killed. So that that those were a couple of moves where I was just I was tucking away something for the very long term that was out of favor that I thought I'd like to own for long term for the long term. 
And I think that's rational and I think it's sensible. But the problem is that A, I hadn't really done the work. So I don't have the conviction that Monish has. So I don't really understand Seritage. And so one thing Guy Spear, who owns Seritage as well, said to me is, he's like, yeah, but Monish may, may have been underestimating just how vulnerable Seritage was at the time. Yeah, they owned great properties. But what if, um, you know, Monish has always, I think, been been happier with leverage and risk, say, than Guy. It's just a, you know, their, their quirks of character. He's just, you know, he's more, more optimistic, more aggressive. And Guy was like, well, you know, Berkshire Hathaway owns Seritage's debt. And so you, and, and Buffett had a huge personal investment in Seritage. So we were cloning Buffett at a much lower price. And the chances were knowing that Berkshire is a very honorable, long-term thinking business that they weren't going to make Seritage go bankrupt. But Guy's point to me is you couldn't really know that. And so maybe I'm misquoting him, but that was, he, he was just saying it wasn't, it wasn't quite as risk-free as Monish seemed to think. And so Guy was sort of um, tr a little trepidatious during that period. He was, I, I don't think he really, you know, he bought more, I think, but I don't think he was aggressive about it. Whereas Monish was like, there's no, there's no risk here. I'm going to make 10 times my money. And so I'm looking at that and I'm just like, well, I don't really know. I don't have the conviction. And so if everything goes wrong, will I be able to stick with it? And so I'm just kind of aware of the fact that I'm a little bit too emotional, a little bit too fearful and a little bit too anxious. Um, and that I'm, I'm a little impatient as well. And so it's, so even though I think I'm going to own Seritage for 10 years, and I think I'm going to own Berkshire indefinitely. In actuality, who knows if I'll have that patience. And, and so, so one of the things that I've done over the years is just to outsource, um, outsource these decisions to people like Guy Spear, um, whose aquamarine fund I've just been invested in for, you know, whatever, 22 years or something like that. Um, because I feel like even though he's slightly fearful too, which matches my temperament and, and he's cautious and he's, uh, he's long-term. So, so he's similar, he's similar to me in his temperament, but he's much more rational, I think. And he's, and he's, he's got much deeper knowledge studied this stuff more he cares about it more uh he has more uh you know he has accounting skills and mathematical skills and and he's focused on it whereas i'm just not and so so i think this again it goes back to this question of self-awareness of just knowing are you playing a game that you can win are you are you set up i mean this is something that munger talks about a lot right like munger munger said if you're five foot three um, you probably don't want to have a career as a basketball player, you know, play games that you can win. And so, so to some extent, I think the investing game is a game I can win because I know some really good investors, but to some extent, I'm also deeply aware that my temperament is bad and then not bad, but not good either. It's, it's, it's a mix. And, and so I also invested, there was one point where I got kicked out of a hedge fund um that i've been invested in for something like 14 years because they changed the structure of it and so i was no longer allowed to invest in it and i remember saying to guy spear so i, I don't want to invest more with you because i'm already too exposed to you so who who should i be looking at and he told me to um meet josh tarasov who i met who's become a friend who i like a lot and again i felt I'm, and i'm not saying this is an advertisement for either guy or josh i'm just trying kind of trying to take you through my my thinking process and so I ended up investing with Josh Tarasov, um, who runs a concentrated portfolio. And I, I think it's closed to new investors, which I also really liked because uh, like Guy, neither of them were asset gatherers. They were both people who ran small, pretty concentrated funds. Josh's is more, more concentrated and more aggressive than Guy's, I would say. Um, and, and one of the things I really liked in, when I met Josh, which again sounds idiosyncratic, is he meditates really seriously. And so he has this kind of calmness where 
So he's a very bright guy. He'd come out of Goldman Sachs and, uh, you know, but he's a, he's also a real iconoclast, a kind of maverick. And he just, so he has a portfolio of about 12 stocks and he's very long-term. He doesn't care what the market is doing and he lets them ride, uh, he lets his winners ride. And, and I can just see he's much more rational than I am. And I, I don't know, I had this at lunch with him a few weeks ago. Um, and, and, um, I remember asking him about his parents and I was saying, so who do you take after more? And he, and his father had been in the investment business. So you would expect that his, it was his father. And he said, no, I probably take after my mother more. And, and, um, and I said, what's she like? And he said, chill. And I thought that was a wonderful word. And when I look at Josh, I'm like, yeah, he's chill. And I'm not. And that's a disadvantage for an investor. It's probably great as a writer. The fact that my emotions are kind of tempestuous and my mind is all over the place and, and I'm constantly kind of reading weird stuff because my intellect is kind of like uh, undisciplined and roving all over the place. Those are really good characteristics for a writer. And the fact that I'm kind of empathetic and emotional and can get inside the minds and emotions of the people I'm interviewing is really helpful. But, but the intensity of my emotional life um, is great for that particular game of writing and interviewing. It's not great for, for investing. So again, it's, it's just, I, so sorry if all of this sounds really self-referential, but I actually think it's kind of important, um, in terms of the takeaways for your, for your listeners of just saying, you, you've got to know yourself and say, am I playing a game that I'm equipped to win? And, and if, if Howard Marks is right and Joel Greenblatt is right and Buffett is right, that most of us should be indexing, that's a pretty good default position. And so I, I at least think a chunk of what I, what I invest should, should be in index funds. And then if, and then if I want to play around with other stuff, okay, but don't, um, but don't delude myself into thinking that I'm equipped to win a game that I'm not necessarily equipped to win. Very good advice, William. I just want to give one quick handoff uh, before we um, continue with the outline because um, back back in the Berkshire weekend, uh, and uh, for those of who have been following the show, uh, th there was no the, Ber the Berkshire weekend. That's the first uh, weekend of, of May. Um, I spoke with Manish, and we specifically talked about his investment in Ceritech growth properties. So I just wanted to give the handoff to that episode. Um, 347 we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes and uh and you can make up for yourself whether you think that that Manish and William are are right or wrong um Manish but is I, more and, likely to be right than I am <laughs> <laughs> right and it's just um and just full disclosure and I think I mentioned this before I I'm an investor in Ceritis as well but uh it, it's a very um popular stock in the value investing community also because of Manish and um because it was uh, Warren Buffett, as, as the very first one, uh, made a um, large investment. I think at, at the time it was uh, at a price of 35. It's trading at 15 now. Uh, money's bought it around six to nine, as far as I remember. Uh, someone along those lines. Um, so, um, and another investor in Ceritech and and a, and a person you mentioned quite a few times. That is that's Guy Spear. And um, I mean, how can you not just Tough guy. Um, we're speaking to him later this year, and it's 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 always great hearing from from him. But uh, more than just speaking with Guy, I actually think it's it's interesting to speak to you about Guy because you have a very close relationship. Um, uh, and I also just want to say for the record, both you and Guy stand out to me as some of the most, you know, some of the kindest people in the value investing community and mm -hmm. in, in, in just in general. Um, you. you know we. We're all shaped by experiences, and you know, having known you, be, being lucky enough to know you for quite some time, I know that you you shared that uh, perhaps being being Jewish and and have refugees in your family that is something that has impacted you. Um, perhaps perhaps not. You can say the same thing for Guy. But um, could you talk to us about uh, your relationship with Guy and and also how you avoid biases whenever you are investing along alongside him in Acromarine Capital, given that you might be kindred spirits too how hmm. do you separate that one thing i'm actually doing 
is I'm exploiting a bias and a quirk in my personality. So because, because I, I'm a relatively loyal friend, I think, and I don't, I don't want to betray my friendship with Guy, I use that to keep myself patient. And so I've invested in the fund for over two decades already. And I've said to him, this is a 40 year investment. And so I, I know that I need to be a long term investor in order to compound, I know that I, I should make fewer decisions. And so part of what I'm exploiting is, is this quirk in my character to keep me patient that I, I want to, I don't want to disappoint guy and embarrass him by saying, yeah, I'm cashing out of your fund. And so it just keeps me patient. And, and Guy, I, I remember him buying Berkshire Hathaway, I think in around 1999, 2000, when, when Buffett was massively out of favor. And he put something like a quarter of the Aquamarine Fund in Berkshire Hathaway at the time when every, everyone felt that Buffett had, had lost it. And same time as Bill Ruane um, was making that, that huge investment or well, had 35 or 37 percent of, of the Sequoia Fund in, in Berkshire Hathaway. And Guy has just held Berkshire ever since. He's just incredibly patient. And I could never have done that. I don't have the temperament to, to sit on something and do nothing for 20 years. Whereas Guy, Guy's default is to do nothing. He's just, he's got this extraordinary ability just to sit on his hands and uh, I, I remember going to him a couple of years ago and saying that I'd interviewed some famous investor who was telling me that, that you know, um, Buffett and Munger had aged out and they just weren't good anymore. And they didn't know what they were doing and we should get out of Berkshire. And I went to Guy and I was like, well, what do you think? And, and Guy was like, yeah, uh, only just did nothing and kept owning Berkshire. And I remember going to Nick's sleep and Nick was just like, yeah, no, it just has a great culture. It's very long term, got a great culture. And so he did nothing. And so part, and, and since then, Berkshire has done tremendously well. And if I would got panicked out of the situation, because one brilliant guy had told me that they'd aged out, uh, I would have got washed out of it. And so so part of what I'm doing in in over in, in this case, I don't think my bias is actually a problem. I actually think I'm exploiting the fact that I'm friends with Guy to be long term and to be patient. And, and he's exploiting his ability to sit on his hands and do nothing to just ride companies like Berkshire and Nestle and stuff like that. And, and some more obscure companies sort of maybe a little racier, um, but to ride them for the long term. So but but to, to go back to this question of my my friendship with Guy, it, it really began we, we were we were actually at Oxford together, but he was a couple of years above me. And I didn't really know him at all there. I, I have this vague memory of him as this kind of dashing young guy with a with a red cashmere scarf dating some um, uh, very attractive woman and, and me being slightly resentful of him. And then and then a few years later we met in New York because I was trying to join this club in New York that traditionally is a very posh club where you play um, various racket sports. And I I play this game of real tennis or or court tennis, which is sort of the old version of tennis that Henry VIII played at, at Hampton Court, which has a, a drooping net in the middle and these handmade balls. It's a very beautiful game. And I played seriously at Oxford. I played pretty much every day while I was at Oxford. So this was the one place you could play in New York. And so I was kind of waging this military campaign to get into this very exclusive kind of waspy club that traditionally was known as being anti-Semitic, like that they, they had never really allowed Jews for a long time. Um, it's no longer anti-Semitic, but it, but it certainly was in uh, historically. Um, and Guy was a member. And so I remember going around and meeting all of these members who could help me get in. And I met Guy and I felt, sh and I got into this club because I was, I went to Eton and Oxford and I sounded like a posh Englishman. And I, I remember going out with Guy after he had helped me get in. He was one of you know the seven people or whatever who wrote letters for me and introduced me and vouched for me. And I felt kind of guilty that I concealed the fact that I was Jewish. And I said to him, would they have let me in if they had known that I was Jewish? And he went kind of pale. And he was like, you're Jewish? And I said, yeah. 
And he said, I thought I was the only one. And so I think that was the moment where we both realized that we were these kind of posh seeming Englishmen, but who actually were secretly, um, you know, getting uh, getting into these very posh environments where they they didn't realize that that we we were we were Jews and that they wouldn't traditionally have let us in. And in some strange way, that created this really strong bond between us, because I think, as I was saying before, with with a lot of great investors, but also with writers, we are outsiders. And there's something about being both on the inside, but also always feeling that you're on the outside, that's very powerful. And I, I see that very much in Guy, that he's, in some senses, he's a, um, he's a consummate insider. He's liked by lots of people. He was, he was a tutorial partner of David Cameron, the former British prime minister at Oxford. I mean, what could be more inside than that? But in his own mind, he's an outsider. And in my mind, I'm an outsider, even though the, the appearance of it may be different, that I, I seem like an insider, but I don't feel that way. And so over the years, we became friends. And we used to we used to meet up for lunch in New York. And we would chat about investing and stuff. And I was a young journalist. And I invested very early in his fund. And I didn't, I didn't realize that he had kind of tarnished his reputation by working for D.H. Blair after leaving Harvard Business School. I just wasn't really aware of it. This only really came out when when we wrote about it in his memoir, The Education of a Value Investor. Um, I just saw this guy was really smart. Um, and I thought, yeah, I'd like to invest with him. And, and, and so in a way, it wasn't very good due diligence. It was much more about um, trusting the person's intelligence. Um, but I didn't, in, I think what I saw also very early on is he had structured it in a way where most of, most of the money was his family's money. And so, so the money really, a lot of the money originally came from his father, who was a successful Israeli businessman. And then Guy had all of his own money in it. And he set it up with this fee structure that was very fair. And so you were totally aligned. So I thought, if I'm wrong, at least he's going to be wrong on a massive scale as well. He's going to hurt too if I'm wrong. And so there was a real alignment of interests. And he's, he's intensified that alignment of interests over the years. So the, the share class that I'm invested in, it, it has a five-year lockup, but there's a 0% management fee each year. And, and and it's based on Buffett's limited partnerships from the 50s. So he takes 25, uh, no, he takes 15% of the profits over a 6% annual hurdle. And that 6% annual hurdle compounds. So he doesn't go back to zero each year. It's like he's made it so that it keeps compounding against him. If he underperforms, he, he's got to get himself out of this hole in order to get paid. And I just thought that was a very interesting insight into his personality, that he'd actually he'd structured the he he structured the fees to hurt himself uh, if he underperformed. And I remember someone someone saying to him, "Are you sure you want to do that? You could be working for many years without earning any money." And he said, "Welcome to the world of aligned interests." And I thought that was really interesting. That's a and and it's the same with Josh Tarasoff with the way he structures his funds and. It's the same with Nick Sleep and, and Zach with the way they structured Nomad. It's the same with Buffett and Munger with the way they structured Berkshire. That they're, they're, they're profiting with you, not off you. And so I, I'm not saying any of this is an advertisement for, for um, Guy or for Josh Tarasov or any of these people, but I think it's a really valuable filter to look at to look at the expenses, to look at the fee structure of a fund and say, are these people behaving in a way that's looking out for my interests? Are they, how, are they, are they eating their own cooking? Is, there, is their family's fortune in their fund? Are they, are they gonna get paid well regardless of how they perform? And, I, and, and then I'll tell you one other thing about Guy. Um, that I thought was really revealing when I had lunch with him a few weeks ago is Guy, Guy has been on this long mission, right? Over 20, 
four years, I think, of running the Aquamarine Fund, of basically trying to recover his family's fortune that was lost during the Holocaust, right? So his his grandparents had a successful um, millinery company, a hat factory, I think, in Berlin, in Germany. And all of their assets were confiscated by the Nazis. And, and so he's been on this mission to recover that lost fortune. And he said to me a few weeks ago, he's like, well, I've kind of done it. Like, we're we're back, like, like, it's actually worked. And so he's like, so what do I do now? What's my mission now? And he said to me, well, I think my mission is to make my shareholders lives, and the CEOs of the companies that I invest with that their, their lives as extraordinary as I can. I thought that's a really interesting reframing of what his mission in life is, right? It's no longer to get back his personal fortune, his family's fortune, it's to make other people's lives as extraordinary as he can make them. And I so I think that gives you a sense of why, why he's such an important figure in my life. Like there's, there aren't many people that you meet in life who you feel they're looking out for you and they want the best for you. And they'll, they'll, you remember there was that wonderful thing in, in the biography of uh, the Janet Lowe wrote of Munger, damn right, where there's a, there's a forward by Buffett. And he says something about, how, how Charlie is generous in the deepest sense of the word. And that there, he said, many times I've seen Charlie take the worst end of the deal with me and with other people, knowingly take the worst end of the deal. And I certainly feel that with Guy, the way he structured the, the, the fees or the way that he's focused now on making his shareholders' lives as extraordinary as possible, not, not just with returns, but in other ways. He'll sort of, he'll sort of say things like, well, I have this, this this kind of timeshare thing in New York. If you want to go, if any of you want to go stay there, just let me know. You know, like if you want a subscription to this, let me know. We've got a corporate subscription. You know, that's there's something really lovely about that. And that's that's had a big impact on me seeing that. I've seen him change and become more and more selfless over the years. And I I went to a wedding a few weeks ago where a, a, a hedge fund manager friend of ours got got married to um, another close friend of ours, a uh, mutual friends of, of Guy's and mine. And Guy had actually introduced them to each other. And and they asked Guy to um, marry them. So instead of having a, a rabbi or anything else, they, they had Guy do it. And it was this beautiful kind of rooftop wedding. And so I'm watching Guy from kind of a, uh, you know, the second row or third row or whatever, perform this thing. I could just see this sort of, deep joy that he took out of um, the happiness of this couple, like, like really deep joy. And he said to me afterwards, he said, I, I think that may have been one of the most important, and meaningful things I've ever done. Um, and he took his role of marrying them and helping them with the service, like so seriously. I mean, he prepared so much for this thing. And and I, you know, he kept wanting to work in uh, God, and they kept being like, "No, we don't want, we don't want any mention of God." And and so he was trying to kind of provide some sort of spiritual aspect to this thing without, you know, in a way that really respected everyone. And um, and I, it was just a kind of kindness and goodwill to it. And I, I think again, like we were saying before, with when when Nick Sleep and and Zach went to Omaha and they saw the kind of behavior that Warren and Charlie embodied and, and their focus on, on businesses and business models rather than trading in and out and lining their own pockets and taking advantage of people, that it had a it had a massive effect. I think when you see people behave in that way over the years, it has an effect on you because it's not... So, so seeing Guy and the amount of joy that he takes in other people's successes or trying to help other people that's had a big effect on me over the years and I, I benefited from it myself because he's helped me in all sorts of ways and I and I'm not trying to hold him up as a saint it's not like he's perfect in every way I, I not in any way saying that like it, one you know we're all deeply deeply flawed but I see that goodwill and 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 what I think the Buddhists would call sympathetic joy or empathetic joy that you know his his ability to take pleasure in other people's successes and it 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 reminds me of that that instruction from Buffett that that you want to hang out with people who are better than you because uh, you can't help but improve. 
And so I think when when I when I hang out with people like Guy or Nick Sleep or 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 a lot of the other people I write about, it kind of I, I hope that some of it rubs off on me because it it gives me a sense of a different way to operate, and and it just it's it's very helpful. It's very helpful. It gives you an alternate model instead of the sort of sharp elbowed model of let me just look out for myself. And and so that that I that that's been a great unfolding pleasure in my life has been to have that that friendship with Guy and just to see to see him to see him behave that way. Um, it, it, it's lovely to see. William, I had the privilege to to speak to you quite a few times, uh, not just on recordings like this, but in but in general. And you know, it's often we have on the agenda that we want to talk about business, but I often find that we talk about living um, according to your own values, whether that is professionally or privately, and and sometimes you know those two intersect, of course. And I think what I'm most impressed about is how deep you've been been thinking about this, and and how vulnerable you also make yourself. In terms of the struggles that we that we all have as we go through life, um, would you be would you be willing to share some of your reflections of how to live according to your values? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. First, that's very kind of you to say. I I, th I think one of the things that you can see from my book and probably also from this conversation is that I'm always wrestling with these questions of what does it mean to live a meaningful life and to live a life that's aligned with who you are and your deepest nature and so when i when i was interviewing people like charlie munger or howard marks or joe greenblatt or monish any of the, any of the people in the book um i'm not just thinking about how do we get rich what can we learn from these people about how to get rich i'm really thinking about what constitutes a successful and happy and truly abundant life. And, and so there's an element in the book and in our conversation here of me searching to, to answer this question of how to live. And that's also, that's also a huge aspect of my, um, of my reading. I, I spent an enormous amount of time reading peculiar esoteric books about, um, Kabbalah, which is this ancient sort of mystical um, form of wisdom that's very, very exquisitely beautiful. Um, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, I've spent a ridiculous amount of time over the last year reading obscure books about Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and I spent a ridiculous amount of time reading David Hawkins books. And, and you know, it, it was actually originally Monish turned me on to reading Power Versus Force, which I think is a very important book. But um, but I ended up reading a lot of his more obscure books, um, with titles like I subjectivity and reality and, uh, things like that. Or, um, and, and I just read them over and over again. And so I'm really trying to figure out how to live and how to think. And, and that's, I mean, maybe, maybe that's one reason why Richard Wise Happy has resonated with people is that it's not me coming and saying, I figured this all out. It's me actually groping towards something and, and taking advantage of the fact that I have access to people like Bill Miller talking about how, how he's drawn on stoicism or, or, um, Howard Marks on how he's drawn from Zen Buddhism. Um, and it all seems totally interconnected to me. You remember that great quote that Charlie would often, um, quote from a biologist about how everything is one damn relatedness after another. And it's it's all related, and so it strikes me that how how you run your business, how you treat your partners, totally related to your relationships or ev everything else. So you think you think say about something like Munger saying um, that if if you want to um, have a good partner, be a good partner. Then then think about what he said about marriage, where he said if you want to have a good spouse be a good spouse, deserve one. That's totally interconnected. There's a total link between the way he's running his business life, his investment career, 
and his attitude to relationships with his with his friends, his partners, uh, his um, his wife. And again, this is not to say that he's perfect, but it's understanding that there's a there's a there's a link that the way you um, that the way you conduct yourself in one area um, radiates out in all of these other ways. And so, th think of something. I, I, I write about this in the chapter on on manga, where I came to this revelation that what really mattered to him was not just the scale of his victory, but it was the manner of his victory. It was the fact that he'd done it in an honorable way. And there was this beautiful story that he told about how the, the best company that he and Warren ever saw, the best business that he and Warren ever saw was a snuff company. So I, I guess this was this was tobacco that you would, uh, I, I don't know much of, much about how, how you do this, but um, but he said it was clear that going in that it was a killing product. And, and so he said, they look at this business and they're like, yeah, it's unbelievable. And they, they didn't buy it um, because it was a killing product and it was clearly causing cancer. And, you know, this other kind of famous family buys the company and makes $3 billion off it. And, and Charlie said, why, why would I have any regret about not having that $3 billion? He said, my life would be worse for having that $3 billion. Um, and I just think that's really fascinating. That's a really fascinating insight into how you want to live your life. And so when I was talking to Ed Thorpe, for example, who, who I know you've interviewed, again, is, you know, one, one of the few people in the investment business who's as smart as Charlie, right? I mean, it's one of the great geniuses of the investment business. And I talked to him about his regrets in life. And he said, I don't regret any of the principal decisions that I made. I just think that's really interesting. That gives you a sense of how do you how do you want to conduct your life when when someone when someone like Ed Thorpe looks back in his 80s, now in his late 80s at his life, he's he's proud of the way that he behaved not just of the fact that he had a hedge fund that didn't have a losing quarter in 20 years. He's proud of his behavior, of the quality of his decisions. And, and I look at Nick's sleep, for example, and I, I had this wonderful interview with Nick and Zach in, in their office on the King's Road in London. It's this beautiful kind of sunny, sunny room in the, the least likely setting. I mean, it's, it's on the top floor of a house in, on King's Road. And they have like their beekeeper suits there, their matching beekeeper suits. And, um, and you know, this is several years after they closed the fund and they still share this office and they weren't going in very often, but they still share the office because they were still friends after all these years of being partners. And Nick said to me, it's a partnership built on kindness. And he said, for example, that when they were setting up the company, when they're setting up Nomad, um, he wanted to have it be 50 50 which was also interesting because nick was kind of the alpha dog like he was he was you know this very confident very successful good looking guy who already had a really good record at marathon where he'd been working and zach had been working kind of at deutsche bank as an, as a sales analyst and had less uh, uh you know you know had less of a clear record of success and nick immediately was like no no let's make it 50 50 um, and he says, you know, Zach is hugely intelligent and he wanted him as his partner. And, um, and Zach was like, no, you should own 51% and I'll own 49%. And that way, if we ever have a dispute about anything, um, you'll decide, um, what the right way is to go. And Nick said to me, when someone has loaded a revolver and handed it to you across the table and said, here, shoot me if you like, he said, how can you mistreat them? And so, so, so their partnership was built on trust and kindness. And so when I see people like Nick and Zach behaving that way, or Guy Spear behaving that way with his shareholders, or um, Munga talking about his relationship with Buffett that way, or Thorpe talking about um, behaving about making principal decisions or saying to me, look, the single most important thing in your life is who you spend your time with. Like that's way more important than, than your money. It's who you spend your time with. 
when I see things like this, when, I, when I'm interviewing people about these subjects and I'm hearing these lessons about how to live and how to behave, I just find it immensely helpful. And, and it's, not, it's not that I've nailed any of this. There's, a, there's an enormous gap between um, the behavior I espouse and, and, and appreciate and admire and the way I actually behave. Um, there are many occasions when I fall short. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be kind of self-righteous and self-congratulatory here. But I think I I think it's really useful to study the great investors with this sense of what constitutes a truly successful and abundant life. And, and I, I remember Molly Munger, Charlie's daughter, saying he was never interested. In, you know, he wanted to be financially independent and secure, but he wasn't interested in doing it and losing the game of life. And that's that's a really important nuance that I would just encourage you your listeners to think about is that the reason these people, the, the, the reason we go to Omaha year after year is not because of how rich they are. It's because they embody a certain type of behavior and principles and manner. And that, that just gives you, it gives you a sense of direction in life. It gives you a sense of, let, let me try to be a little bit more like that. You said something very profound there. Well, all of what you said, William, was was very profound, and you talked about you know, these outstanding people and, and how it's not only about learning from them about achieving financial success, but there's this extra layer of 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 living by the right values, uh, being there, being useful uh, for other people, for the community. So, I I, I have I have selfless uh, or selfish reasons to ask you this question, William. So I just want to preface the question by, by by saying so but it's it's easy if i can use that word to study amazing people who are not only smart but who also live by wonderful values it can be a bit more challenging if there are really smart people financially successful people but where you might not agree with the way they live their lives or you might even find them despicable or whatever kind of work you would you would use mm. for that, um, because as you said, like how you spend your time, that is your your life. Um, how do you wrestle with that? That you come across many mm. financially successful people, but also perhaps you don't feel emotionally that it's nice to not just interview because that might be for X hours, but also you have to recall that interview and go all your notes and spend weeks on sort of like mentally with that other person. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you wrestle with that? that? That was a very powerful process when I was writing the chapter about Sir John Templeton, who, who, as I admit in the book, I didn't particularly like or warm to. And, and I felt kind of guilty about that because everyone always makes out that Templeton is kind of this saint and was, you know, hugely moral and was brilliant. And, and so I was wrestling with the fact that there was something cold and austere and judgmental that, that um, we, we talked about this the last time I was on your show, but I, I, I was, I was trying to explain, here's what I got wrong. Here's what I failed to understand. And that I think I now understand about why he was extraordinary and what he was trying to teach me. So that, that wrestling process was incredibly helpful and fruitful for me. But on the whole, in this book, I've actually kind of made a point of not writing about people unless I admire and like them, which is a very idiosyncratic thing to do for a journalist. Because when I, when I was coming up in the world as a journalist, I was perfectly happy to write attacks of famous people. I, I worked at Forbes, for example, and I loved taking down the very, the very first story that I did for Forbes was a story called Mining the Suckers, which was about a mining billionaire who I just thought was a total scoundrel and unethical. That was great fun for a young, aggressive journalist with a chip on his shoulder wanting to show the world how smart he was um, and how fearless. That was a, that was a really... I, I was able to take those flaws in my in my character uh, and harness them to do some really good investigative stories. 
And I, I did a story for Money Magazine, a long piece many years ago. It was about the Kaufman Fund, which had this terrible fee structure where they were just making a fortune regardless of how poorly they performed. And, and my story was headlined, um, uh, do these guys deserve $65 million a year or something like that? And it was basically about how they'd set up this thing where they didn't have their own money in it and they uh, they had underperformed the market by something like 50 percentage points over the last three years while making $180 million between them. And, and so I, I think there's a real place for that kind of aggressive journalism about people who, and in that case, I actually did like them. And I thought they were really good investors. I just think they, they, they were kind of screwing their shareholders. Um, and, and so they were kind of poster boys for this kind of uh, less savory, more self, self-serving area of Wall Street. But in this book, I, I just didn't want to write about people that I didn't admire. And so I'm just, it's, it's just an idiosyncrasy to focus on people who I think are kind of admirable and instructive. And I, I think there are some people, some journalists would look at it and would be like, ah, you're, you're, you're too close to the people you're writing about. You like, you like them too much. And I think that's a, that's a perfectly fair criticism. I, I think the upside of it is that because I'm writing about people I know well and who I can empathize with, they open up in a way that they wouldn't if I was out to get them. And so there's a kind of intimacy to the kind of writing that I'm doing where someone like Bill Miller will actually tell you what it was like to go through an incredibly painful period of underperformance. Um, and so that's partly the reason he's doing that is because he senses that I'm not out to get him. Because I'm also telling him about the periods in my life that have been very difficult. And so this, this, is, this, is, this is the way I've come to deal with it myself is just to focus on people who I think you can learn, you can learn from not only about how to get rich, but about how to think better and how to live more wisely. Because ultimately, just the ability to make enormous sums of money by playing this game really intelligently, there's nothing hugely redeeming about that. I mean, there's, there, there is an element of this game that's tremendous fun and tremendously interesting. But the fact that you manage to make billions of dollars by beating the market or by charging obscene fees doesn't make you inherently admirable. And so why, why, why celebrate those people if they're not admirable or insightful in how they conduct their lives? Wonderful. Wonderful, William. Um, you know, it's, it's always such a pleasure speaking with you. And, you know, I, like, like I mentioned last time you were on the show, like your book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, that's, that's the best book I've read here in 2021. It's, it's, it's just a wonderful book. And I think people can just tell from listening to you that, you know, it's a wonderful book read by a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. Um, before I let you go, I'd like to give you an opportunity to um, to share with the audience where they can learn more about you, but also but also richer, wiser, happier. Where can they learn more? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a website which is williamgreenwrites.com, and I'm on Twitter. I'm re reasonably active on Twitter, where uh, I'm William Green seventy uh, two. I'm on LinkedIn, and I'm really happy to hear from people. I'm. I'm, I'm perennial aware, perennially aware of the fact that I'm getting behind on replying to people. Uh, and I feel guilty about it as messages come in on, on Twitter and LinkedIn and at my website and stuff. But I, I really like hearing from people because I, I feel like we're all, we're all kind of on this journey together of trying to figure out how to invest better, but actually how to, how to think better and how to live better. And so it, it's, it's lovely when I hear from, uh, from people who, who've, uh, who've been studying the same sort of stuff as me, who've read my book and are like, yeah, yeah, that really helped me. I, I, I love that. So, so please feel, feel free to, feel free to reach out, but um, uh, don't be offended if it takes me a while to get back to you. Duty noted. William, again, thank you so much for taking time to, to speak with us again. I, I hope we can invite you back another time and, and, and do uh, this. Anytime. Um, it's uh, it's absolutely wonderful. All right, guys, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, make sure to subscribe. If you listen to this on your podcast app, make sure to follow if you don't already. 
Uh, and if you like it, make sure to write a review. Um, that helps other people find the content. William, um, I'm sorry we have to let you go now. Huh. It's been absolutely wonderful. Have a wonderful Thank day. You. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.